Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special discussion on the ORF sort of uh, magnum opus on Afghanistan called the Afghanistan's Year of Reckoning 2021. Uh, this, of course, was a joint production of the ORF Research, Observer Research Foundation, Wilson Center uh, from uh, US and INEMO, INEMO from Russia. And we have the three authors here, uh, or the four lead authors, uh, to discuss their report. Uh, of course, you know, in Afghanistan, the problem is that you are always looking through a kaleidoscope uh, tube. So that means that each day, each turn and twist changes the entire picture. Uh, but having said that, I must say that this report, the underlying understanding and the description and the analysis uh, perhaps holds right even today. Uh, some of the key elements that I thought, and I would just flag it so that the authors also reflect whether there is a need uh, to modify what they had written or there are some changes. Uh, first, of course, this was written at the time when there was still hope uh, that the U.S. review was taking place and the withdrawal may uh, sort of get extended to November, uh, but that did not happen. So extension of deadline was one key part that all the uh, sort of uh, authors referred to. Uh, then, of course, they had talked about the internal political cohesion in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't know the, whether the picture has become any better or has, has become worsened. Uh, that is something we'd like to hear from the experts. Then all of you touched on the Afghan military capability, uh, how it is uh, on its own and what it will be able to achieve once the total withdrawal takes place. And of course, each of your papers focused on Taliban. Uh, uh, its tactics, whether it's engaging seriously in the peace uh, process at all. Uh, and plus, we have seen that from 1st of May, when the withdrawal started, that they have used a particular military tactics in Afghanistan. It has been a blitzkrieg, literally, uh, in, in 34, practically 34 districts. Uh, while provincial capitals have not uh, fallen, uh, they have uh, created a lot of sort of damage and, and demoralization in the Afghan security forces. Plus, very disturbing videos have started coming out in terms of uh, uh, chopping off hands of people who have been uh, accused of uh, robbery or today's video of uh, the cold-blooded uh, slaying or literally assassination of 22 special forces, uh, Afghan special forces soldiers who had surrendered. So, well, well does this point uh, to what future um, holds for all of us when the Taliban is uh, more in control. Of course, till now they have not given any plans on governance. Uh, what they have shown really is that the violence is the only trick uh, they know uh, and they are using it effectively both to strangulate cities but also to sort of seal off the borders and the border posts uh, which deprives uh, uh, the government not only of essential supplies like petroleum and others which come from Central Asia, but also the uh, customs revenue. Uh, then, of course, you had all talked about the regional actors, their perceptions, how they will react to, uh, will, will that still hold? Uh, because when you wrote this report, I think Taliban was supposed to be in some sort of a peace negotiations. We were looking at a more brighter and a hopeful future of Taliban uh, in power sharing agreement. And each one of you have talked about the Pakistan's critical role in the region uh, in Afghanistan, both in terms of bringing the Taliban to the negotiations, but importantly, also in uh, sort of tuning down this level of violence that you are seeing. Uh, and uh, it appears that the policy is uh, to grab Kabul uh, by whatever means. So these are some of the key issues that you all have made. And of course, we have new issues will come up as we discuss uh, your report. So, but may I leave these thoughts with you and start with uh, the first presenter, which is uh, Alexei Davidov. Is that correct? Yes, Davidov, correct. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for hosting this event uh, at this crucial time. My name is Alexey Davidov. Uh, I'm a research fellow at IMAMO. I study U.S. Uh, foreign policy in the Middle East, Central and South Asia, peace building and democracy promotion practices. Regarding, of, regarding the topic of our discussion, I would like to share a number of my observations regarding 
the recent uh, trends uh, and my thoughts about their possible implications for the near time future. First of all, uh, from my point of view, the April speech of President Biden served as a signal uh, to Taliban to intensify their offensive. I tend to think uh, that this was made deliberately since uh, the United States has already their experience of Iraq withdrawal in 2011 uh, that shows that uh, by naming a specific day of, of uh, withdrawal beforehand, uh, one will intensify the civil unrest in the next day. Second, um, I don't see that this decision was made uh, under any serious pressure, neither from the outside nor from the inside of the United States. Uh, we might remember that since uh, 2015, the coalition troops were able to stabilize the negative trends in Afghanistan and maintain the situation under control. And we don't see massive anti-war movement uh, at the same time in the United States, just like uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, let's also remember that after the scandalous publication of the Washington Post in 2019, uh, about the corruption in Afghanistan and the long-time ineffectiveness of the U.S. Uh, policies there, uh, this problem didn't become a topic of the electoral campaign. For a long time, parties didn't, uh, both parties didn't raise uh, the Afghan war as a subject uh, for debate or Congress inquiry, because for the last 20 years, officials uh, from both sides uh, of the aisle were involved in this war and therefore we're not interested in politicizing it. Uh, finally, bearing in mind these uh, two points, uh, first about the signal and the second about the absence of pressure, I asked myself, why didn't the administration even try to improve the conditions uh, on the ground in order to avoid discrediting the efforts uh, of their predecessors? The withdrawal was scheduled uh, on the first year of Biden presidency in order to have the ability to correct uh, the unfolding trends in the near in the next three years. And since Afghanistan is located ne directly near the borders of Russian Federation and China, uh, and it affects sensible topics of extremism and terrorism expansion, I tend to think that the decision to announce the withdrawal on the anniversary of 9-11 was mainly directed by the motivation not to end uh, the old conflict, but to make a step in, uh, in front of the new one uh, that is unfolding. And that, uh, from my point of view, that might have uh, serious implications for the near-time future in the region. First of all, today Taliban is, uh, has direct control over the northern Afghan border and uh, has the real leverage to affect the trends that might affect uh, the future of the region. Uh, depending on the policies, uh, depending on Taliban's policies, uh, its experience uh, might become a shining example for uh, that might ignite uh, the wave around the radical movements in, in Muslim wor world. Now we also know that uh, Russia has uh, uh, ally obligations in front uh, towards uh, its Central Asia allies and. Therefore, Taliban, uh, by cooperating with Russia, will affect uh, whether this uh, obligation should be proven uh, in practice. And at the same time, uh, Taliban has the direct control over the uh, over whether the gray zone of uncontrollment, let's say, uh, will uh, expand uh, further uh, f away from uh, the AFPAC region, uh, and this might affect uh, the uh, the the possibility of creation of uh, Xinjiang uh, separatist movement uh, in this uh, in this uh, region. As always, uh, the situation creates a field for cooperation between four uh, great powers, uh, Russia, China, India and the US. But today we see a lot of facts that are uh, affecting this uh, trends and uh, from my point of view, uh, we should uh, wait uh, until the, the end of the year in order to make uh, some prognosis what, or what will be the further uh, trends in this region. Uh, how uh, will uh, the US rejoin the G JCPOA? Uh, what will be the RAND policies? What uh, will uh, be the policies towards uh, India, China uh, and Russia regarding the deadline? Uh, the, the, 
the deadline that uh, Putin and Biden uh, draw regarding uh, what will happen within the first half year of this year. So we'll see uh, how the trend will be unfolding and therefore uh, we'll hope that uh, it will not be more dramatic than we see right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think what I should do perhaps is call your co-author also to give his point of view. Mr. Alexei Kupianov, uh, would you take the floor and you have five, seven minutes, you want to supplement something? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, okay. So I think I would like to add uh, a bit to my friend Alexei's words. So I think that events in Afghanistan are developing very quickly and faster than we expected because uh, the United States Army are uh, living very quickly, very unsuccessfully because uh, the Americans literally bring down the situation when they could not have done so because a power vacuum is created which Taliban immediately filled. And uh, the Kabul regime may find itself in a situation where it may simply uh, not have time to consolidate its forces and uh, so and get used to surviving without American support. And this will become clear until September, I think, when it will be possible to roughly understand uh, what to expect from next year. And uh, it seems to me that the withdrawal of American troops will give us more topics for discussion because uh, it will soon be clear whether the Taliban will be able to take the major cities in Afghanistan. Uh, and if so, then we expect a wave of refugees in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and uh, possible something like possible revival of the Northern Alliance and possibly humanitarian catastrophe in the cities of Afghanistan. If not, then we will see the uh, continuation of the war and its analysis, of course, will be very interesting. Uh, but I want to repeat the main idea that, uh, that I put into our Russian part of our report. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan will remain unstable until the process of transition from the tribal rural society uh, to a modern society more suitable for life in society of 21st century ends. And uh, oh, as an alternative, the world of the 21st century itself will, will not change so much that medieval tribal society will look natural there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I move on to uh, Michael Kugelman? Michael, uh, the floor is yours, and then we'll come to Ambassador Rakesh Sood. Uh, of course. Your presentations have also made me think, and there are some questions, but I'm sure you'll have questions from in the chat box if there are others. Uh, otherwise, perhaps later I'll use uh, my own prerogative to ask a few questions. Michael, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Ambassador Sinha. It's, it's great to be a part of this panel, and it's been great to participate in this uh, report process with my uh, Indian and Russian colleagues. So the, the top line predictions in the report were that U.S. troops would likely move toward a withdrawal policy, that a fragile intra-Afghan dialogue would continue to struggle, violence would not diminish, uh, and that's this is of course exactly what we're seeing now. So at least in, ter in terms of the basic predictions, I think we were on the mark. So I'll offer some quick thoughts about what to expect for U.S. policy in Afghanistan moving forward. And then I'll briefly discuss how our three countries can try uh, to chart out some collaborative paths in Afghanistan moving forward. On the issue of U.S. policy, um, one thing the U.S. Will, will very likely not do, at least not during the Biden administration, is reverse its decision to withdraw. Uh, I, I really think that the U.S. is leaving and it won't go back. There has been some, some commentary in recent weeks arguing that if things continue to go from bad to worse on the battlefield in the weeks and months ahead, and the Taliban uh, threatens to take Kabul and seize power, that this could prompt Washington to go back on its word and, and send troops back to Afghanistan. I really don't think this will happen for several reasons. First, uh, President Biden based his decision to withdraw on appraisals of terrorism threats to the United States emanating from Afghanistan. He judged that that threat was not sufficiently great as to warrant the continued 
presence of U.S. troops. He did not base his decision on the insurgency strength or its violence or its brutalities or anything. So this means that uh, the optics of the U.S. expediting its withdrawal amid this seemingly unprecedented Taliban assaults are the, the optics are, are really bad. Um, but it's very consistent with the administration's policy. Uh, it's not going to let the insurgency dictate its decision to leave. Second reason why the U.S. is likely leaving for good is that the administration believes that its bigger that its biggest priorities lie elsewhere. Uh, President Biden was very explicit about this. He's spoken about the need to redirect attention to uh, new and emerging terrorist threats elsewhere, uh, to the strategic competition and rivalry with China, and to emerging uh, global threats like climate change. Third, if U.S. troops were to return to Afghanistan down the road, the Taliban would redeclare war on them. The U.S. Taliban deal in 2020 produced an understanding where U.S. troops would withdraw and the Taliban would no longer shoot at them. Uh, and this is obviously not what Biden wants. That would be a, a political disaster. Um, fourth point, the war is very unpopular in the U.S. Biden's decision to withdraw certainly may have been based on a conclusion that the terror threat emanating from Afghanistan to U.S. interest in the U.S. homeland um, uh, was not si significantly strong. But he also made the decision knowing that this is what public opinion in the U.S. would support. And when Biden had opposed the U.S. troop surge during the Obama administration when he was vice president, the main reason or one of the main reasons he opposed that is that he did not think Americans would support it. And Biden, of course, is, is someone that served many years in Congress. He's very attuned to and sensitive to public opinion. So in terms of what the U.S. plans to do, obviously, one can't be sure about anything these days. But I would argue that there are four objectives. Uh, first and most important is completing the withdrawal. And um, the administration has really been focused laser-like on the operational and tactical dimensions of the withdrawal to the detriment, perhaps, of um, other key part priorities like the, the intra-Afghan uh, dialogue. The administration has seemingly been so focused on the withdrawal that it hasn't likely dedicated ample policy space to questions of what next, how to prepare for the impacts of the, the withdrawal, particularly in terms of the implications for human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan. Second objective, which is already being pursued, is determining how to develop a counterterrorism capacity in Afghanistan without boots on the ground. Uh, the U.S. has, of course, been exploring options and bordering states, including Pakistan, for basing agreements that would enable U.S. troops to launch counterterrorism operations. But for now, the, the default plan is to use existing U.S. bases in the Gulf as launching pads for CT operations. But that's not the most efficient solution because obviously they're further away. Those bases are further away from Afghanistan than would be the case if you have a, uh, arrangements in countries bordering Afghanistan. And I think that achieving this, this over the horizon CT capacity will continue to be a priority for the administration because Biden sees Afghanistan through a counterterrorism lens, but also because the administration certainly recognizes that a worsening insurgency and civil war, while not in a, in of themselves ter terrorist threats to the U.S., those things, those conditions can create a more conducive environment for externally focused terror groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda to, to get stronger. The third objective is to continue to support Afghan security forces. We know the U.S. is committed at least for, for some time to provide financial assistance. Uh, it's also exploring how to continue the training and advising mission, whether it do, through doing this in third countries or through remote, through the use of remote and virtual platforms. Fourth and finally, the U.S. will continue to provide diplomatic support for the peace process, though we don't know how much longer this support will last. Um, the U.S. has been relatively quiet on this front in recent months, even as Ambassador Khalilzad has continued to travel to the region. In fact, he's, he's there now, um, I believe. Um, so I think that for now, you can expect U.S. officials to keep leaning on Pakistan uh, to press the Taliban to stay committed to the peace process and to lower violence. The Biden administration will not buy uh, Pakistan's argument that it's done all it can and that it has limited options for using its influence over the Taliban. The problem is that the U.S. has lost a lot of its own leverage now that it's withdrawing. Troops were its most potent tool of leverage vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. It's lost that. Aid conditionality or the threat of reducing assistance is really its sole only leverage tool, but given the uncertainty of future U.S. assistance beyond the next year or so, and given that future U.S. assistance would likely be less and not as long term as was the case previously, 
uh, the potency of this tool shouldn't be overstated. And it's clearly a tool that would be more effective with the Afghan government than it would be with the Taliban, which does not depend on foreign assistance, at least not presently, as Kabul does in a big way. So given the limits to U.S. leverage and given that the future U.S. commitment to supporting the inter-Afghan dialogue and the broader reconciliation process are far from open-ended, I think it behooves Washington at this point to try to encourage a broader regional diplomatic effort in Afghanistan, one in which regional players can pursue shared goals in Afghanistan, which go beyond the intra-Afghan dialogue. I think it's important to look beyond that, given that the Taliban, quite frankly, is, is unlikely to seriously commit itself to talks with the Afghan government unless it were to face more pressure on the battlefield. And I think it could be a long time before that happens, if at all. And this brings me um, finally, as I conclude here, to the to the report that we put together. Um, you know, I, I argue that there's, I argue and I still believe that um, there is potential for some degree of US-India-Russia cooperation on Afghanistan. All three countries share interest in Afghanistan, especially uh, more stability and less terrorism. This cooperation would not be easy by any means. U.S.-Russia tensions, of course, are high, though the two have shown a willingness to set aside those tensions to work together uh, on the intra-Afghan dialogue. Of course, they've participated in a series of meetings together along with China and Pakistan. And also, while the three countries agree on these broad ends of more stability and less terrorism, they don't always agree on the means to these ends. And we can discuss this more during the Q&A. But I think there's, there's potential for the three to establish a dialogue or working group, possibly in collaboration with Kabul, that discusses how best to address the, the terrorism threat. Uh, other topics for collaboration could include counter-narcotics, connectivity projects, public health. Um, and this is not just an attempt to promote cooperation for the sake of it and to try to find a silver lining in the midst of, of all this bad news in Afghanistan. It, it's something that presents, that represent, uh, represents an opportunity for the Biden administration, which has emphasized its desire to restore U.S. global leadership and to work with friends and foes alike on, on shared common goals in Afghanistan. And also the, the elimination of the U.S. military footprint will elevate the status and influence of Afghanistan's neighbors, who at the end of the day can't just get up and leave, unlike the U.S. Uh, they're forced to live with the consequences of what's happening in Afghanistan and the U.S. Withdraw withdrawal. So in effect, the U.S. withdrawal amplifies the importance of working diplomatically on multilateral levels to tackle challenges that that will endure um, after the last U.S. soldiers have left Afghanistan. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good that you've highlighted the recommendations, which are also part of your report. Uh, Ambassador Sood, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, let me say it is a pleasure to uh, see old friends, and uh, we worked together, um, you know, for a couple of months to get that report out at the point when the Biden administration was still undertaking its review. Um, the title that we gave it was A Year of Reckoning, and I think first and foremost, 2021 has certainly proven to be a year of reckoning for Afghanistan. Second, I think that um, while a number of predictions that we had in the report have turned out right, the speed with which the unraveling has begun or the speed with which the Taliban have gained territory is something which uh, I don't think we thought that would happen. I mean, you know, in our report, we basically came around to the idea that perhaps at that time, remember, the withdrawal date was 1st of May. Under the, uh, under the Doha agreement, uh, the withdrawal date had been 1st of May. And uh, the Taliban were kind of saying that they will not tolerate any delays. So we had felt that perhaps the withdrawal date could be pushed by about six months. And there was talk of a UN... Uh, sponsored uh, bond two kind of a thing in Istanbul and all of that. And now the UN Secretary General even appointed uh, a special representative, Ambassador Jean Arnaud, uh, who I understand has been traveling in the region as well. Uh, but I think uh, so, in that sense, when 
President Biden announced that his deadline instead of being six months would be, say, uh, 9, 11, four months, I guess. Because Trump pushed it by about four months uh, to, nine, to the 9-11 uh, commemorative date. I guess, I mean, two months here or there uh, probably wouldn't have made a difference. But nonetheless, I think the symbolism or the finality of it is what tipped the balance. And that is what we are seeing. Uh, you know, I guess that part that it could unravel so quickly is something that was not uh, as apparent to us when we were writing our report in February as it is uh, today. And uh, that is something which should cause us, all of us, concern. However, I think it is important that, first of all, we stop calling the Doha agreement a peace agreement. I mean, you know, it is a safe passage agreement. So why at least, you know, the moment we start calling it, I mean, Khalilzad, for obvious reasons, Ambassador Khalilzad, for obvious reasons, will still call it an agreement that provides a framework for peace and reconciliation. But I think, I think uh, it is quite clear that it is essentially a safe passage agreement, and that is all there is to it. The rest of it was, uh, you know, was just, um, you know, for the birds, so to say. And uh, that's where it is. And so, therefore, um, you have to, in a sense, accept one thing, that it took the Pakistani system about 10 years from 2001 till about, say, 2011-12, once the U.S. agreed uh, to for the Taliban to open an office in Doha. Now, that was a kind of an acceptance. You know, it, it meant that the Taliban leadership, which had been uh, uh, sort of under wraps, as it were, the Quetta Shura, etc., etc., could now have a public face in Doha. So there was a public acceptance, which was, uh, that was step one. And it took another till 2018, when the U.S. opened direct talks with the Taliban, thereby granting them, although the process of legitimization, which was the second objective that uh, Pakistan had, for the Taliban, because I think it was quite clear that one thing they had realized was that uh, the last time around, Taliban did not enjoy legitimacy. There were only three countries that had recognized them, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE and Pakistan. So this time they needed to ensure that the Taliban enjoyed a degree of legitimacy. So that was objective number two. Once the Doha office was up and running, that meant that and you know, there were various uh, useful idiots, I would say, who had been talking about the fact that Taliban had changed their ideology and all of that. I would love to uh, have some of them around. I mean, we, we all know who they were uh, and who kept telling us that, uh, you know, this is a different Taliban and all the rest of it. And, um, and gradually the Taliban, uh, um, you know, they were received in various capitals, they were received in various cities, they were received in all over the world. I mean, they were received in Tehran, they were received in Urumqi, they were received in Islamabad, they were received in Moscow, they were received in European capitals, they were received in Arab capitals, they were received in Istanbul and Turkey. So let's be clear, that process of legitimization, however, the direct talks with the US still hadn't happened. Now that was the major breakthrough that happened in 2018. So I think that the process of U.S. disengagement, in a sense, has been on the cards for a long, long time. So let's, I think we need to uh, step back and see the consistency of the Pakistani approach. And I think it is quite clear from the little that we have seen of the developments that have taken place in recent weeks, that the Taliban have not changed their ideology. I mean, the fact that they have just gotten the better of the U.S. in terms of their negotiation. I mean, to put it bluntly, Ambassador Khalilzad didn't have a plan B. He started by saying, oh, nothing is agreed till everything is agreed. But essentially, the Taliban called his bluff and got 
and the US accepted what was always the ISI or Taliban's plan A, which was an unconditional withdrawal backed by a timeline, full stop. And that is what is what we are seeing. So now the question is, if the Taliban strength is about, say, 70,000, 80,000, and the Kabul government security forces, army, police force, armed local police, etc., is about the last I, last figure I saw was about 308,000, which is down from the 352,000, which is the authorized strength. I mean, it is still, you know, more than enough to ensure the security of uh, large parts of the country. So obviously what is playing here is the fragility of the Kabul regime and the threat, the threat perception of uh, the fact, I mean, the, you know, that uh, systems are breaking down. So when you have a threat perception or your general perception is that systems are breaking down, then clearly, uh, you know, the unraveling process moves much faster. Given that, I think it is quite clear that uh, the, you know, there is this saying that be careful what you wish for because there may be a catch in it. So I think uh, we had, uh, we had uh, many countries who were uh, sort of saying that the US had outlived its work welcome and they had to leave and they were part of the problem and all the rest of it. And I think it is true that staying on of the US was not going to help the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, but now that they've left, <laughs> and they've basically cut their losses, I mean, they say, well, we'll continue to fund, um, you know, provide the money, but that money will only flow as long as there is an integrity of the chain of command. Once, if there is a fragmentation of the regime and if the Taliban go back to the kind of behavior which, uh, you know, which we are already seeing signs of, I think, uh, you know, the killing of the, uh, I saw a report I think it was mentioned that some of the Afghan Air Force pilots are being now subjected to targeted assassination. We saw the report today about the special forces, uh, 25, 30 of them being executed uh, quite uh, brutally. So if the Taliban are going to go back to those kind of things, I would not be surprised if uh, international sanctions um, I mean, forget any fund continuation of U.S. funding, but uh, even sanctions could well be envisaged. So then comes the issue as to uh, how does the region deal with it? Because I think that the U.S. is unlikely to, as uh, Michael said, the U.S. is unlikely to re-enter the scene and. Uh, if this unraveling continues at the rate at which it is happening, then um, it would certainly happen during 2021. I mean, so this really would be a year of reckoning. Uh, ultimately, the question also that comes up is, as I said, I mean, you know, the three imponderables, how one issue on which we don't really have a very clear view is how have the Taliban, how unified are they? See, because the Taliban in the 1990s had a very unified structure under Mullah Omar. We know that Mullah Omar's death created a bit of a power tussle. We know that there are different kinds of shuras. We know the first fellow who succeeded Mullah Omar after Mansoor was killed. There is another guy with two deputy leaders, one of whom Sirajuddin Haqqani is somebody on whom the U.S. has a $10 million bounty. I think it is still there, Michael, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, so, you know, so that is part of it. Then there is the Doha uh, people who apparently are more favorably inclined towards a negotiated outcome. And then, of course, there are the guys on the ground who are doing the actual fighting, some of whom are uh, not willing to go to the negotiating table. So what does this do? And then what we don't uh, realize is that uh, we have uh, 
you know, a multiplicity of foreign actors now present. I mean, they may be in smaller numbers, say about, say, a couple of hundred of the ETIM or a couple of hundred of the IMU or a couple of hundred of um, other groups, uh, the Pakistan-based groups which have morphed and have emerged and there are uh, quite a few of those operating out of uh, Afghanistan. And then there are the people who have returned from Syria, some of the Arab groups that have come back from Syria. So there is a new kind of a constellation of uh, actors there and that centralized chain of control, which even the Taliban had during Mullah Omar's days in 1990s, no longer exists. So I think the prognosis is that uh, this is going to lead to a complete fracturing of the situation as far as Afghanistan is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, now, what order do we follow? Should we go with Dr. Jennifer, uh, as one of the panelists, and then Shushant, maybe after this. Yes, Dr. Jennifer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is a real honor uh, to be among you today, and I want to congratulate the authors on such a comprehensive report that looks at the situation in Afghanistan through the lens of three important powers. Um, and, you know, the, as we all know, the, the trends that we're seeing in Afghanistan are very worrying. Um, the increase of violence is something that um, I think was anticipated, but still quite shocking. Uh, as, as Michael said, I think that the presence of the United States in Afghanistan was no longer tenable. Um, there was a great deal of surprise by many of the actors that the US made this withdrawal decision in April. Um, it surprised me that there was so much surprise about this, given how consistent President Biden has been over the years and his statements upon this. I think when President Biden appointed uh, Khalilzad or allowed uh, Ambassador to Khalilzad to continue in this position, it was pretty clear that there was going to be strong continuity of U.S. policy towards Afghanistan from the Trump administration that was focused on uh, withdrawal and uh, withdrawal, uh, you know, honoring the agreement that was made in Doha, the so-called peace agreement, which it is very clear that it was not. This was an agreement about U.S. withdrawal, uh, first and foremost. But I think something also to bear in mind is to understand why the current violence is happening the way that it has. Something that I think we're not paying attention to is that violence in Afghanistan has, been, has skyrocketed in recent years. And the country has been anything but stable. And if you're the, looking at the position of the United States, it became very clear that the Taliban could have taken large population centers with the United States present in Kabul. This would have been even more embarrassing, I think, for the United States had the Taliban uh, pursued this strategy, which I think it very well could have, considering um, that the U.S. would still be there. The United, uh, the, the U.S., of course, um, you know, many uh, observers here in the United States note that there have been few U.S. casualties in Afghanistan, thus the cost of staying is was low, but this you know, reduction in casualty rates was really the consequence of this agreement in Doha. And if the United States would have stayed, the violence between the United States and the Taliban would have necessarily increased. And the United States would have once again become a very serious target for the Taliban. So I think this is also something to bear in mind as we reconstruct these alternatives of what it would be like if the United States stayed it could very well be the case that the Taliban could control vast swaths of territory, as they have, but make larger pushes on cities, which they intended to do with the United States there. And I think the optics of this would have been very, very bad. Um, as, as many have noted that the U.S. and other foreign actors really do have very limited leverage over the Taliban now. Um, and there seems to be uh, sort of a 
a, recog a, re a recognition of the Taliban, uh, a resignation to the fact that they are going to be important political players internally, and how these players, how these regional players deal with this question is going to be very important in the future. And I'm going to get back to this in a second. But I just want to say a few words about why the North, especially the North, has fallen so quickly. Um, although it is surprising, I think, to many, we need to take a step back and understand that although this seems quite sudden, if we take this in context, it's not. There has been enormous violence in northern Afghanistan, really beginning since 2013, that has accelerated in recent years. I've looked at um, IOM, the International Office of Migration Statistics, that show that 27% of northern Afghanistan's population has been displaced since 2013 and really picked up over the last three or four years. So although there's attention to new refugee camps that are being set up at a pl around places like Mazari Sharif, this is not new. This has been a humanitarian crisis for a long time. Why has this, uh, why have these districts fallen so quickly? One is structural. There are so many districts in Afghanistan. This is, Afghanistan has a governance problem. So since 2001, we've seen proliferation of provinces, we've seen proliferation of districts. Even at one point, about 10 years ago, I was in Kabul asking the independent director of local governance how many districts there were in Afghanistan, and nobody could say for certain how many districts there were. So many districts have been created over the past 20 years, and there's reasons for this. A lot of it has to do with patronage, a lot of this has to do with um, you know, trying to find arrangements within the state. And a lot of it has to do with the incentives provided by the aid economy. When I started doing research in Afghanistan in 2005, there were 15,000 villages, around 15,000 villages in the country. Um, today, the government estimates there are more than 30,000 villages in the country. Why has this number increased so much? It has to do with the delivery of aid and the proliferation of these districts. I mean, yes, it's we have to think about in terms of population. So in terms of population, we're not seeing large population centers falling, but we're seeing large swaths of territory falling. There were so many districts that it became impossible to defend all of them and impossible to have governance structures um, working in, in all of them. So there's an economy of scale issue that I think we also need to consider. Um, but the other issue has to do with legitimacy of the central government. And many people I've spoken to believe that the central government over the past several years has been more interested in fighting uh, Northern Alliance uh, commanders and the warlords in the North than it has the Taliban. And this is whether this perception you know, is accurate, it's definitely a perception. And if we look at many conflicts that have taken place in the North over the past five or six years, they have to do with confrontations between Ashraf Ghani and the so-called warlords in the North. And this is really the consequence of the lack of legitimacy, I think, that the central government has in many places in the North. And this is also a consequence of the fact that the governance structures in Afghanistan are so very heavily centralized that they cannot take account for Afghanistan's diverse um, cultures, diverse institutions, diverse ways of doing things at the local level. So if there is to be a power sharing agreement, you know, there's some talk this morning that there's going to be, I haven't seen confirmation of this, there's going to be negotiations in, in Doha. I don't know if others have, have heard this, uh, that Abdullah and uh, his team are headed to nego some negotiations with the Taliban. If there's going to be a power sharing agreement, there has to be a new kind of constitution that devolves power to the districts and to the provinces. But let me just wrap up with sort of these regional dynamics. Um, you know, if there is going to be a power sharing uh, agreement um, within the country, there has to be an agreement of countries outside of Afghanistan for how to deal with the new government that emerges. And what we're seeing is a really interesting situation emerge among the immediate neighbors. All of the countries around uh, Afghanistan seem to be resigned to doing business with the Taliban. And this includes Russia and, and, and China, 
um, and the Central Asian republics, which uh, Uzbekistan in particular has been quite active in um, negotiating directly with the Taliban. This week, there's going to be an important meeting in Tashkent of regional leaders to talk about Central and South Asian connectivity. And on the one hand, it seems like a really odd time to be having this discussion, but on the other hand, it's a very important time to be having this discussion. Because if going forward, you know, many have made the point that the Taliban now control these bridges that were built by the United States. Um, and trade is now going on these bridges that were built by the United States that connect Afghanistan and Tajikistan, for example. We can see this as a bad thing because the Taliban control it. Or we could see this as a good thing that commerce is continuing regardless of who is in control of these borders. And I think what has changed regionally is that countries in the region are no longer willing to see Afghanistan just as a pariah or see the Taliban as a pariah government. They want to engage it. They understand the costs that they incur when they cannot rely on uh, Afghanistan as a trading partner and as uh, and Afghanistan sees itself as sort of this regional hub. So there are possibilities to continue trade and infrastructure development as odd as that may sound at this difficult time because both the Taliban and the Afghan government share this interest in pursuing this, which I think is quite interesting. And it is an area where Russia and Central Asia and even to some extent India have common interests in, um, in pursuing uh, this kind of regional cooperation and facilitating this. So it is risky. It also assumes there's no spoilers. It also assumes that the Taliban um, is, is true to their word on protecting these agreements um, and it can deter spoilers from emerging. One other issue, um, as we look at sort of Afghanistan's northern borders um, and refugee crises that are taking place, and we've talked a lot about uh, terrorism I think it's become clear what we what we have learned from the Taliban over these past several years is that the Taliban is not particularly interested in foreign expansion. So 20 years ago, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty when the Taliban were taking over places in the north. That would they try to expand into places into Central Asia? I think we know now that that's not the case. The question is, are there har are they harboring terrorists? Uh, who have designs on these countries. And it'll be very interesting to see how the Taliban continue their negotiations with these Central Asian countries based on that. But the issue of Syria and Iraq has been raised and the role of terrorism. And something that I just want us to, to think about is that we, we tend to think about the, the, uh, the spillover of this conflict into other places, but we can also see the risk of spillovers from Central Asia going into Afghanistan. And there have been worrying trends I've noted over the past several months with a large number, not large numbers, but significant numbers of Central Asians who are traveling to Afghanistan, who are joining, uh, seeking to join the Taliban. And often they join splinter groups that are related to ISIS. Um, some have been involved in taking over district centers with terrible brutality. To me, this is the greater risk to the Central Asian republics rather than a, a spillover of the Taliban. It's when their own citizens and are able to enter Afghanistan um, and then well, potential blowback. So President Rahman in Tajikistan has then called for, uh, this was six months ago, called for his own citizens to arm the border because he was unable to, the risk was not from the Taliban spilling over, the risk was from their own citizens. So this is really something that we need to keep an eye on as we think about regional uh, perspectives and how these different countries are going to come uh, to an agreement over the future of Afghanistan. So there's a real opportunity for Russia, Iran, China, India, and the Central Asian republics to come to sort of a modus vivendi with the Taliban, but, that would be for development purposes, that would be almost for humanitarian purposes, and we have to ask whether that's at odds with larger security goals. Thank you. Thank you. Good point you made, actually. Um, what you said was also confirmed in the video yesterday, uh, which came out on the assassination of the special forces uh, people. There was all uh, Uzbek-speaking fighters, which were fighting with Taliban, and they were the ones uh, who killed them. Uh, so yes, that is a concern. 
but we'll come back to the regional concerns and the concerns of Russia, etc. later. Uh, maybe have Shushant, then Nandan, would you like to say, and then uh, Kriti. Kriti after Sushant. Okay. Right. And I can have some questions uh, for you on what uh, Mr. Lavrov said after EM's meeting, perhaps. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity. I'll just quickly make, I was told I have about three minutes or four minutes, so I'll quickly make 10 points. Um, and they're not necessarily in any order. Uh, but uh, some of my points are, uh, I'm taking off from what I've heard my other colleagues uh, say today. I think the first thing we have to recognize, and I, I have argued this also, and I think we should not remain in denial anymore of the blitzkrieg which is taking place and the way the Afghan army is crumbling. And to think that this thing is going to last till even the end of the year, uh, I wonder if it will uh, last even till the end of uh, the next month. I, I'm a little skeptical uh, on that count. So I would uh, probably, uh, I, I, I think all assessments which we make, we need to now factor in that the Taliban are, uh, the military is going to crumble. I don't know what happens uh, to that after that, but I think the Taliban are taking over. Uh, secondly, I'm so thankful that Ambassador Sood, uh, you know, in his own inimitable manner, uh, spoke about, you know, this nonsense about the new Taliban, the changed Taliban. It's been nauseating hearing this for the last 10, 15 years, uh, and it's been constantly drilled down our throat, even though there was not an iota of change in what the Taliban stood for, and they never made any, uh, they never made any bones about it. They were very clear. The language had changed; it had become more ambiguous. Uh, but their their methods had not changed. Their attitude had not changed. Uh, what they thought of women, what they thought of minorities, what they thought of other minority sects, nothing had changed. Yes, I think uh, they had learned the art of how to engage with the rest of the world, and somehow the rest of the world was so taken in by it that they imagine that there is something called a new Taliban which has come in and that they have learned the lessons of the past. Uh, frankly speaking, I would really want to know what lessons of the past they have learned. The only lesson they seem to have learned is that they need to occupy the north before they start moving into the south. And, and that is what they seem to be doing. So militarily, they've learned the lessons. But otherwise, if anybody thinks the Taliban is a new evolved beast, good luck to them. Uh, related to this, uh, uh, where I, you know, I'm, I'm a little uh, surprised that everybody is talking about uh, the fragmentation of the Taliban or the various divisions with the Taliban. We are hearing stories of it. I have not seen any real manifestation of these divisions play themselves out on the ground. We are hearing that, you know, yes, there is somebody, the Haqqani net, and, and I myself believe that the Haqqani network is really... Uh, uh, Pakistan's leverage over the Taliban. The Taliban have the TTP as their leverage over the Pakistanis. So these games will continue. But by and large, I have not seen, I have seen a complete unity of purpose uh, so far in everything that the Taliban have done. I have not seen any uh, clash. There could be some differences. There could be uh, some disagreements uh, between them. But I have not seen anything more than that. So I think we need to really uh, rethink this business of uh, the unity of Taliban. Third, um, you know, we are all talking about chaos in Afghanistan. Frankly, I, and I think chaos in Afghanistan disturbs everybody, which is why you have the Pakistanis, and I'll deal with my favorite country a little while later, but you have the Pakistanis and everybody else actually doubling down behind the Taliban. So while the Pakistanis are telling everybody that they're very concerned about, you know, the Taliban takeover, that the terrorism will come into Pakistan, that is for Western audiences. What are the Pakistanis telling their own people? What is the president of Pakistan tweeting? He is tweeting that, look, we are looking forward to the Taliban and their colleagues establish peace in Pakistan. And we are imagining things. The guy is telling you what they want out there to their own audiences. There are speeches being made. The foreign minister is saying things like, you know, the Taliban are really nicely evolved. The uh, home minister, the interior minister is saying that. All of these guys, you have the Taliban Khan as Prime Minister of Pakistan, and yet we are imagining that the Pakistanis are not backing the Taliban. I really want to know one thing which the Pakistanis have done 
to stall the Taliban advance. I would really love to know that because everybody who says that the Pakistanis are very concerned about the Taliban takeover, they are actually the trend Taliban are guardians was a government sponsored trend. And we are <laughs> scared of the Taliban. So that is the third. So if you really want no chaos in pa uh, Afghanistan, then I think the people who don't want chaos and there has been a not in the same manner I am saying, but I, I think the Russian position in this particular report uh, does mention it in passing that, uh, you know, uh, subject to certain conditions, the Russians would not take it very amiss if, for example, the Taliban was to come and pacify uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but those conditions are, of course, the devil is in the detail. Fourth, on the governance model. Frankly, you know, we are all waiting with bated breath that the Taliban are promising what kind of a governance model they have. Um, frankly, uh, good luck to anybody who thinks that it will be, you know, a postmodern kind of a governance model. I think it will be much more of a Middle Ages or Dark Ages governance model, given what the Taliban stand for. But if anybody imagines that there will be something very liberal and liberating about their model, good luck to them. Uh, peace process, I can't, I, I, I really uh, find it strange that people are still putting some faith in this, this amorphous peace process. I think Ambassador Sood said the right thing. It was basically a kind of a free passage out of uh, Afghanistan, right, uh, without molestation. That is what the whole peace process, so-called peace process has been. There has no been no peace process and uh, I have always maintained that this whole concept which the British started way back in 2010 that uh, re the, uh, the reconcilable Taliban versus the irreconcilable Taliban. This was such a work of fiction. Because if the Taliban were reconcilable, they would not be Taliban. Now, this simple fact, I don't know how so many geniuses around the world simply could not see this. And then they talk about power sharing. How can an Amir ul Mumineen ever share power with anybody else? It is one thing to throw some crumbs at other people. But to call that power sharing, I think that's, I don't know, I don't believe in it. Uh, uh, sixth point, enthuse radical movements. But this was always going to be the case. If the Taliban had won, Afghanistan has always been a bit of a witch's brew as far as terrorist groups are concerned. But if the Taliban was to win, and as has been made clear today that everybody is saying, uh, and sir, please stop me if I cross my three or four minutes. Uh, but as has been made very clear, uh, on, on, on this panel that, uh, you know, this uh, the, the, the Americans are not going to come back and the Taliban know it, the Pakistanis know it and the terrorists know it. So what better place in the world to go to and collect and uh, make it terror central once again than Afghanistan? And both for reasons of Pashtun Wali as well as for ideological reasons, the Taliban are not going to ref uh, 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 refuse them refuge. And anybody who thinks that this newfangled notion of beyond over the horizon, I think it's called, over the horizon CT capability, when you were under the horizon, you could not manage your CT in Afghanistan. How are you going to manage it uh, over the horizon? You know, these are nice sounding terms, nice, very sexy sounding terms, but frankly, uh, best of luck with th that CT model. Northern Alliance, I think we can forget about it. There is no Northern Alliance. I don't see any new force emerging and the Taliban are trying to ensure that it doesn't happen. I would be very pleasantly surprised if that was to happen. There is no Ahmad Shah Massoud. There is none of those leaders. Uh, and even Ahmad Shah Massoud towards the end was virtually fighting a losing battle. Uh, the warlords, certainly I don't see them stand much of a chance against the Taliban, if at all. Uh, regional players, I think we, we've spoken about regional players playing a role. Again, good luck with that because I don't see how regional players are, see eye to eye. They might agree on some things, but I think the areas of disagreement are far greater than areas of agreement. Uh, and each of the regional player has his own agenda, his own uh, uh, you know line to plug. Uh, so I don't see a regional role and Frankly, I don't see how the regional players can bring about some kind of a peace in Afghanistan. Ninth, sustainable. <clears throat> I think we can forget about it. Uh, that thing is not going to come in. It might come in for six months, one year. Beyond that, uh, I, at least I don't see that coming from the Western side. And finally, uh, I, 
I don't see any sign, none whatsoever so far at least, of the Americans actually either leaning on the Pakistanis, really, you know, uh, really turning the screws on them to make them deliver. They haven't done it when they were in Afghanistan. I don't see them do it now. And maybe if you somebody argues that now uh, they can do it much more easier because they're not dependent on the Pakistanis, I would love to see some sign of it. But those are not the noises we are hearing from Washington right now. I might be completely mistaken on it. So I don't think that the Americans are going to show any ire or any anger or exact any retribution from Pakistan for their perfidy and their treachery. I don't see them do it. I don't think the Pakistanis expect that to happen. And I think the Pakistanis think that the Americans will either outsource Afghanistan to them, which is why there is some talk about some bases and other stuff. Uh, at least if they have to fly, uh, you know, these over the horizon uh, operations, they will still need Pakistani um, uh, airspace. So I don't see what, you know, uh, uh, the Americans really uh, turning the screws on Pakistan. And I think the Pakistanis have got away with it. Uh, what follows from this, uh, you know, it's very difficult to predict the future in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kriti? Thank you, Ambassador. Um, my congratulations to the authors for writing what is an excellent report. Of course, this will have to be updated not too soon, given that the situation is changing, if not on a daily basis, but an hourly basis. Uh, but there was plenty to go from, and I'm just going to try to make my comments right at the end, although most points have been covered. Um, out of all the regional countries that we've been discussing, India, even though it doesn't share a border with Afghanistan, still remains in, I believe, the toughest situation. Because like Michael pointed out in his report, that's because out of all the regional countries involved in Afghanistan, India's least bad outcome remains what is the most unlikely. So while India would probably prefer the Taliban to be in some sort of shared power agreement rather than an all-out civil war, that's still not a preferable outcome for India. So all other regional countries, be it Pakistan, China, uh, Russia, or Iran, they've all been able to, over the course of the past two decades, been able to shift their goalposts in terms of what they consider is the least bad outcome. Um, and their engagement with the Taliban and different stakeholders in the countries uh, remains stronger than what India's um, engagement has been. So while India's involvement in Afghanistan has changed from first only dealing through the Kabul government, uh, and now it's sort of uh, pivoted its uh, policies, and it's now speaking to a wider group of actors on the ground, India's still playing catch up. And there's a large way, there's a large, huge way to go in order to catch up. So if India does want to remain a serious uh, player in Afghanistan and engage in the peace process uh, in a serious way, its calculations regarding the Taliban uh, will shift. If earlier the discussion was, should India be talking to the Taliban, that changed to when should India talk to the Taliban? And now it has to be who, who, should, who in the Taliban should India talk to? And that India talking to the Taliban doesn't mean a minister sitting down with Baradar somewhere and having a conversation, but it means that India has to develop contacts at some level in the Taliban hierarchy, be that at the local level, um, to sort of articulate what India's interests are, or more importantly, to gauge that at what threshold uh, will India be allowed uh, to continue its aid programs uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, as for India's uh, work with regional countries, of course, I remain a little pessimistic about what that role could be. All different actors, as we've discussed, have all different interests. Um, and Russia, Iran, and China have been rushing in to sort of fill the strategic vacuum as Washington withdraws. Uh, so it remains tough because they've been focused on ensuring that their short-term losses uh, are not there rather than gain long-term benefits. But working with Russia and Iran, I believe, will remain in, India, in India's best interest. They're traditional partners when it comes to cooperation in Afghanistan. Um, and while the bilateral relationships between each country and Kabul have, of course, evolved, uh, there remains some scope for some convergence of interests. So in all, uh, all of the articles we talk about, uh, these have become sort of keywords where we talk about there can be cooperation on counter narcotics or women's rights or connectivity. Uh, but these are important things which need to be in action now very soon, now that we're a month and a half away from the drawdown. 
Um, and it's important that India sort of works within this and gets a framework together on what can be done and what specific what specific role each country uh, can play regarding Afghanistan's future security. Um, and as Sashan pointed out about how uh, it's unlikely that the Taliban um, will wait to make greater progress, I think one thing we forget also about the Doha Agreement is the sort of the secret annex that the Taliban had signed with the US that we don't really know what it has. Um, and that also will remain key on what is in that. Um, and if it's something in terms of what sort of what kind of attacks are prohibited from both sides, um, what sort of uh, troop move about U.S. With withdrawal, uh, how the U.S. is going to withdraw and sharing that information with the Taliban. Uh, it's also possible that the Taliban just so that the U.S. can project to the domestic audiences about having a victory in Afghanistan, that the Taliban might might wait for what they call a decent interval so that the U.S. leave. They wait a few months and then they can start entering provincial capitals um, and seizing power. So that's that's also an important part of the agreement that we sort of look over. But that will also hold the key to what exactly happens uh, on 31st August going forward to the end of the year. Thank you. Panadi Nandan, the floor is yours. Uh uh, thank you, Amar. Actually, I uh, <clears throat> really don't have much to say. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, there are several questions that have been asked. If you look at the question and answer session under the published uh, thing. So maybe since we don't have much time left, maybe we should address uh, those questions. But prior to that, I just want to make one small comment. And uh, that is uh, triggered by this <clears throat> possibility or not possibility of Northern Alliance. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether there will be a Northern Alliance or not. I mean, I'm not getting into that. But I'm quite certain about one thing, that there will be some forms of resistance. And as long as there are some parts of the border that are not controlled by the Taliban, there is an opportunity for external players to support these uh, pockets of resistance. Now, the question is, uh, is the old, uh, you know, Iran, Russia, India uh, trilateral going to work? Or is it going to be a more complex uh, order? Where is, I mean, only time will determine. And second is, I'm sure a lot of people are talking to each other already, trying to figure it out. The third angle that I would like to point out here is that it will require a remarkable amount of agility in terms of diplomacy if you are going to simultaneously talk to the Taliban and attempt to keep the resistance going. You know, it is going to be a very, very difficult game. And I think given the fact that all the major players have more or less committed themselves to talking to the Taliban, uh, this resistance may be a bit of, uh, I mean, supporting the resistance may be a bit of a problem because it will have to definitely be covert. It will not be overt uh, like it was, let's say, uh, in the late 90s. Without further ado, I mean, I think we should address some of the questions that are there in the chat box. If uh, if you don't have questions as the chair, that is. Don't worry. We have the minutes. We have everything. No, I had a question actually uh, from the Russian uh, presenters. You see, from the report, what I made out was that while Russia would not um, support an Islamic Emirate, it it can it will be very tolerant of the Taliban. Is that a correct read of your report? And second, in the first presentation, you said that I sensed that there was a hint of certain conspiracy about the uh, Biden signaling Taliban to raise uh, the violence or to capture North. Uh, why would you say that? Because, you know, Till now, we had heard that the conspiracy was involving ISIS and not Taliban. Taliban was uh, the good guys who were negotiating and they were 
reasonable. So why would uh, you worry about Taliban capturing the North? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm sorry for my maybe sounding a little bit conspiracy, uh, that my words might uh, uh, sound like a, a conspiracy, but uh, I man mean that meant that uh, the announcement uh, was uh, a mis not a mistake. I don't know whether it was made deliberately in this sense, uh, but it was uh, a thing made uh, that uh, before uh, Biden administration, um, uh, Obama administration was very highly criticized. Uh, the generals, uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. Uh, didn't withdraw in 2014 uh, was the uh, bad Iraq experience of withdrawing. This was a very uh, important topic in the U.S. Uh, media by that time. So that uh, the fact uh, we know that uh, Biden, being uh, vice president, for sure knew that bad experience, and uh, the fact that no one right now is. Uh, um, talking about this, uh, for, for me, uh, speaks that it was made deliberately. So, and and we we see that uh, this uh, announcement was uh, read by uh, Taliban forces as a signal to go forward. We will not uh, do anything regarding that. And uh, Taliban proved uh, to be a very a strategically uh, strategic force. They have uh, their goals. They simply gain won this uh, confrontation by uh, waiting, by uh, knowing that uh, uh, they are simply there for stay forever, and uh, the external powers are eventually will go. Uh, depend, uh, but only it depends on uh, the conditions that. They have, and uh, since uh, uh, since uh, this uh, administration decided to end the foreign war, they decided to go no north for the uh, in the northern border. Why the northern border? Because uh, there, as I said, uh, we we see that there is a kind of leverage on uh, the near uh, near. Uh, uh, states uh, like Russia and like China, which are uh, members of the Security Council, uh, which may affect the decision uh, that was made in the early 2000s regarding uh, naming uh, the Taliban as a terrorist organization. And if uh, and this uh, change uh, in, in from, from v, knowing that, uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, this. Uh, the Taliban is acting rationally and strategically, and we see that uh, it's a rational player in this sense that may manip manipulate the um, the policies of the great powers in this in this sense. Great. So I'd love to add if you please. Uh, uh, can I? Huh? Yeah, please, Doctor yeah. Alexei. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah, yes. So, yeah, thank you. So there was no absolute nothing conspiracy in my words because I, I said that Americans are simply living too quickly, uh, in my opinion. Because of this, they do not allow the Kabul government to keep the uh, well the territory. Uh, the Taliban are not a very pleasant partner for us, although they are better, of course, than the Islamic State. And to be honest, I do not understand the reproaches from our many of our Indian colleagues against our diplomats who express their readiness for dialogue with the Taliban. Uh, what should they say when the Taliban seize power in Afghanistan? We have an alternative. Either we, uh, we send uh, troops into Afghanistan immediately, or we are trying to somehow build relations with the Taliban, uh, which seize power in the state on the southern borders of post-Soviet space, which we have pledged to defend. Of course, our diplomats say that they are counting on dialogue with the moderate Taliban. What do you suggest they do? Thank you. No, no, in fact, I don't think we have any objection to anybody engaging with uh, moderate or hardline Taliban. It's uh, their choice. In fact, uh, one view also is that this is maybe Taliban's way of assuring uh, and securing um, Central Asia from ISIS and IMU, etc. Uh, including the Chinese Badakhshan because they're capturing some strategic dist uh, 
areas which could be of direct concern to you. Uh, so uh, anyway, we can debate that, but there are a number of questions which have come. Uh, one, of course, relates to what will be the future of the UNAMA mission in the current context. Uh, Shashant, uh, would you like to take this question on what effect do you see on India if Taliban gains control in Afghanistan? What be your recommendations? Is there any rationale in engaging Taliban when it is controlled completely by Rawal Pindi? Uh, then uh, will, of course, India be forced to close the embassy in Kabul? Uh, so these are three India-related questions which I've got. Uh, somebody wants to know about China, uh, China's role. Uh, how does Taliban calling them friends pan out? Uh, is China supporting Taliban or funding them? Uh, so anybody, anyone can take these questions. Uh, so, um, so, sir, uh, in it, my apologies. I believe my mic was on, but there was a crisis situation I was trying to handle. No, so, we didn't hear you. Um, so, uh, so on the Taliban, look, number one, uh, I think uh, my personal uh, dislike for the Taliban notwithstanding, uh, I think the what the government of India's position, what seems to me to be the government of India's position, I don't speak for it, uh, is that, uh, you know, engaging with uh, somebody like the Taliban does not necessarily mean according to legitimacy or approving of its actions. But I think, uh, uh, you know, we are also trying to open some uh, doors and windows. Uh, I don't think there's any illusions in India on what the Taliban stand for right now. Uh, and that uh, the fact that they are basically Pakistani proxies for now. How long they will take uh, remain Pakistani proxies because, uh, you know, it's an old saying that uh, you can rent an Afghan, you can't buy him. So uh, how long uh, that rental arrangement with the Pakistani lasts, I don't know. But eventually uh, something uh, is got to give. Uh, and just like it happened in the 90s uh, when the Mujahideen came into power, uh, we didn't have too many contacts with them, but finally, uh, you know, they became good friends of us. Uh, perhaps something similar might happen in the future. Uh, who can say? Uh, it is possible that there might be a strategic pause uh, from the Indian side for now. Uh, we might not have too many cards to play uh, for now. Uh, but, you know, uh, people keep talking about an end game in Afghanistan. There is never any end game in Afghanistan. Every end game is the beginning of a new great game in Afghanistan. So, so I don't think uh, we need to be very despondent or feel that, uh, you know, uh, we have lost out. Uh, yeah, maybe for a couple of years, perhaps we might not exactly uh, have our presence in Kabul or some of the other parts of Afghanistan. But I think we will uh, remain a player. Uh, I, I don't have uh, many doubts on that count. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, this whole, uh, and I think, sir, you... Uh, mentioned that in your tweet, the same thing which I've been talking about. People keep talking about, you know, the Indian investment in Afghanistan will go to dust. It wasn't an investment that India made in Afghanistan. We invested in the people of Afghanistan. We were building dams, we were building roads, we were building bridges, we were building electricity and power transmission lines, we were building schools, uh, we were doing developmental projects. This was not giving us any financial return. We are not Chinese. We don't do, uh, you know, things like that. So it was, we were trying to build up capacities of the Afghans. If the Taliban want to destroy it, just too bad, you know. Uh, and and what I find strange is that they want to destroy something which has been built and then look to the West to find, which is what the Pakistanis are plugging for. That first you destroy whatever has been built, then you look to the West to plug in money so that you can do reconstruction activity. The real profit is in that, actually, you know, uh, for the middlemen in Pakistan. But uh, we are not in that business anyways. So we did what we did for the Afghan people. Uh, if the Taliban want to destroy the dams we have built and everything else, just too bad for Afghanistan. Uh, it's not our investment, really. Uh, it was our assistance to Afghanistan because we want to see it stabilized. So I think that it, it need, people need to understand what we were trying to do in Afghanistan rather than talk about, you know, some kind of a Chinese CPEC kind of a project in which they're going to bleed the Pakistanis dry. I don't think that's our model of working with the countries which are friends. 
Uh, and finally, uh, look, uh, like I said, uh, I don't know how the other regional powers are going to take it. Uh, and it is entirely possible that I think as Jennifer was saying and a couple of other people also said that the Central Asians, for example, uh, you know, will will try and uh, be more pragmatic about the Taliban, try and see if they can find some kind of a via media, do business with them. But if eventually the Taliban are going to remain the Taliban, then I think there will be problems and serious problems among uh, the Stans as well. Uh, so, so I don't think that, you know, just because the Taliban, it, it seems uh, quite imminent that the Taliban are likely to capture power in Afghanistan. Uh, and I agree with what Nandan said that uh, this does not mean that there will be no resistance, but that resistance will probably not be of the Northern Alliance variety. Uh, and we don't know what the nature of that resistance will be. So all of that is up in the air. Uh, and uh, Afghanistan is like cricket, a game of glorious uncertainties. If I can just I say something about this question of the Northern Alliance, if I may, and just very briefly. I think that if we look back at this, the government in Kabul over the past um, 10 years, or, or since Ghani has been in power, I think many people saw him as a, you know, a technocrat, a state builder, someone who would be delivering services, and less as someone who would be jockeying with uh, these warlords. And I think if we look back at his rule, um, one thing that we can understand is that he was probably much less effective as a technocrat and as someone who was delivering services that he had promised, but much more effective in undermining rivals for power. And if we want to understand why we may not see a Northern Alliance, it is, I think, his actions um, in undermining these uh, and co-opting some of these and, and co-opting, undermining the legitimacy of some of these regional players, I mean, internal to Afghanistan regional players. Um, will be also partly responsible for this, in addition to um, uh, the Taliban blockading those northern borders. Great, thank you. Uh, Nandan, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, in fact, I just want to continue uh, with the thought that was expressed earlier by Sushant, but my question is to uh, uh, Jennifer, and I can see that there is a very similar question in the uh, uh, Q&A section. Uh, this, uh, Jennifer, relates to what do you think, I mean, in a nutshell, what do you think will be the position of the Central Asian countries, and particularly of interest to me is Turkmenistan, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a Taliban regime in Kabul? I think it's really hard to say with any certainty what Turkmenistan's position will be, given how elusive the government there has been. Right. So, I mean, it is interesting, however, that the Taliban were in Turkmenistan this past week. Um, and it's also very interesting that the Taliban, uh, when they were in Moscow not long ago, this was maybe last week uh, as well, a, a delegation was in Moscow negotiating with the Russian government. And and they said uh, you know, they made some some deal or they said that they were they made a statement about the. Uh, Central Asian Afghan borders, but of course they made the statement in Moscow um, about you know telling Russia that they would not threaten their borders, meaning Central Asia. So to me that was a really interesting um, uh, statement from the Taliban saying that we recognize Central Asia as your sphere of influence. But I think it's really hard to know with Turkmenistan. And do you know Turkmenistan is facing such a, a devastating uh, internal political dynamics, you know, a near famine situation. And that, you know, as we know, famines are not uh, natural calamities. When we have famines, they're a result of political calamities. Can I weigh in very quickly, Ambassador Sinha? Yes, please, Michael. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, so just two quick points, one on, on China and then one on the, you know, the whole potential endgame uh, in Afghanistan. I think with China, it's, it's easy to sort of get carried away in these somewhat hyperbolic uh, comments about how you know, the China is going to swoop in and fill this vacuum left by the United States after the withdrawal. And I'm not sure I'd go that far. Um, you know, China has been 
remarkably cautious in terms of its involvement in Afghanistan and its footprint in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. I mean, it's willing to take a lot of risks in terms of investing in some pretty insecure areas. If you look at its agricultural acquisitions in sub-Saharan Africa, um, you know, it's, it's willing to invest in some pretty unsafe areas. But in Afghanistan, it's been very cautious. Um, it really has not done much. And of course, it has some major assets there, the copper mine, uh, the Anbar copper mine and so on, but it's been pretty quiet. So that suggests to me that it's going to be even more cautious once, uh, once uh, the withdrawal is complete. But one thing I could see, and I think that China has two basic objectives or two basic concerns in Afghanistan. One is a desire to be able to be more of an economic player in terms of infrastructure projects and all. The second main objective is to deal with what it perceives to be this threat emanating from the TIP, this Uyghur militant group, a threat that I believe China over inflates and exaggerates in order to justify its horrific treatment of, of its Uyghur community. Um, but one thing I could see happening uh, in the coming months is China trying to informally, privately engage, or at least try to engage, reach out to Taliban, to the Taliban to see what type of arrangement can be worked out so that it can start doing some of these infrastructure projects in Afghanistan, including in areas controlled by the Taliban, in order to get buy-in from the Taliban so that the Taliban won't try to attack these, these projects. So I, that's something that I could see China trying to do is to try to, to try to take forward a relationship with the Taliban, which at this point doesn't really exist or it's very modest. Uh, other point very briefly, uh, you know, as we sort of think about what to expect in Afghanistan in the future and looking at how the, our three countries can cooperate and so on. I, I don't know if I think that it's going to be a situation of the Taliban taking over by force, at least not anytime soon. I think what's more likely is we'll see a, a civil war, which I think already exists, getting even worse. Um, and I say that because, you know, for four very quick reasons here why I don't expect the Taliban take over anytime soon. So long as the U.S. contributes some financial assistance to the ANSF to ensure that equipment could be purchased and salaries can be paid and so on, that I think will help the Afghan uh, security forces hold things together. Uh, the ANSF will be able to take back some territory that's been seized by the Taliban, and in fact, it already has. It doesn't get as much attention as all the territory that the Taliban has seized, but still, it's happening. Uh, we could talk about the major concerns and dangers of the resurgence of all of these anti-Taliban militias, but at least in the immediate term, that does provide a kinetic boost to the ability of the anti-Taliban side to, to push back against the Taliban. Um, and finally, you know, the Taliban lacks strong popular support in Afghanistan. It's hard for an insurgency to really get really far if it doesn't have that buy-in very grassroots levels um, across the board. So that's why I think, unfortunately, that's not to, to underplay how terrible things could become in terms of the violence and, and so on. But I just don't think we're yet at a point where we need to think about, or worry about a Taliban takeover. And I disagree with the U.S. intelligence estimates suggesting that within six months after the withdrawal, the government in Kabul will fall. Thank you. I think we have answered most of the questions, except the one on Yunama, the role of Yunama. I think, uh, uh, will anybody like to answer that? Otherwise, we'll uh, bring it to a close, I guess. It's tough to, I guess. Uh, is that a serious question, sir? Uh, so that's why, because that will be something that the UN Security Council will have to decide, and we really can't sort of. No, but, you know, but the way the way I look at it is that just as every every diplomatic mission there will be taking its own call about the security of the individuals who are posted there, so will the United Nations. And uh, if let us say, if the Western embassies. Amar, if the Western embassies are closing down, we heard that the Australians have pulled out yes, lock, stock and barrel. So uh, if, let's say, some of the European embassies uh, decide to close down, um, then clearly the UN Secretary General uh, will go to the Security Council to say, look, I mean, uh, I cannot ensure security because of the kind of systems that we have and uh, therefore I need to pull out. He may, I mean, at that stage, the UN Secretary General may just have a skeletal staff which would enjoy, which would say work out of the US Embassy because the US Embassy has its own force or whatever it is. But otherwise it would be very difficult for the UN Secretary General to ask uh, 
his people to stay there. So I think that uh, like other diplomatic missions, the UN will also be taking a call and the, they will certainly not want to risk the lives of any of the international civil servants who are currently deployed in Kabul. Can I oh, ask you. one final question? Yes, sure. Again, okay. again to actually Jennifer and Davidov, to both of them. Do you think that the Taliban will meddle in Central Asia through some of the extremist organizations that were there earlier and resided in Afghanistan when the Taliban was in its first avatar? Thanks. You asked this question because I had this on my list. That is a good question. Do they? Do the Russian colleagues, do they see a threat to Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan specifically? Uh, I think that they might try uh, to <clears throat> to use uh, the control over the territory and the possibility to, uh, to control the trends that are unfolding in uh, Afghanistan to uh, somehow manipulate uh, great powers to in try to uh, involve their, them in, in the conflict. Uh, and everyone knows that uh, no one would like uh, such scenarios. So yeah, I don't, uh, I think that uh, that might uh, happen and we should uh, bear this in mind. Great. So I think... Uh, we, Jennifer, Jennifer, yeah. Jennifer, Jennifer, yeah. wanted to respond? So I, I think it's actually less likely in the short term because the Taliban are really going to be concerned with consolidating their power. And a big part of consolidating that power is shoring up some of these international relations. So do they have an incentive to really upset their closest neighbors uh, who can in turn destabilize? I mean, these countries do have leverage over the Taliban directly through their borders, through their ability to um, you know, they have long relations with many of the opposition leaders. Um, so this is, I think, a, a, an area where I don't think the Taliban have much of an interest in trying to destabilize their neighbors. Now, one of the things that's, but the question has always been, you know, to what extent does the Taliban control these groups, right, that are inside of Afghanistan? And I think if the, if the Taliban did have designs on parts of Central Asia, we would have seen this long ago. And we haven't seen that. We haven't seen efforts, uh, spillovers, I think, on that. Um, oh, I see some some <laughs> uh, opposition to this point. But, um, and, and that's why I think it's made lots of sense for the Central Asia, a very interesting strategy, especially from Uzbekistan, uh, that has engaged with the Taliban so directly. Um, I think that in this way, the, the, some of the Central Asian republics are really hedging their bets so that regardless of who is in power in Kabul, they can continue trade. They are, they are worried about access to the sea and, and, and these things. Um, but I don't think that the Taliban have much of an interest um, in destabilizing Central Asia right now. Yes, uh, Mr. Davidov, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I would like to, just to reflect on what Jennifer said. I, I totally agree with what you said so since uh, the consolidation of power is a very strong argument regarding a uh, rational uh, player. And uh, uh, I meant that the, there is a physical um, instrument that they might use. It depends on whether they will use it or not. And I think that uh, it will very much depend on whether uh, Taliban is classified as a... <clears throat> as a a terrorist organization, or uh, they will uh, seize this uh, this uh, status uh, uh, from them. And in case, uh, uh, in, in a scenario where uh, great powers uh, maintain this status uh, of a terrorist organization, uh, um, this uh, unties the hands for Taliban for such actions. Since uh, if uh, great powers decide to isolate it, uh, there will be no other mean but to terrorize uh, near nearby states imagine uh, uh, if we had isis in this in that position i i'm absolutely sure that they would do the the same things that they did uh, in iraq and syria so when uh, when they are isolated completely from 
uh, from the world, they will be acting like pirates. But uh, right now, they will be try to show that uh, they will try to show that they are effective and that they will uh, uh, try to um, fight with the narco traffic. Will try to save some gainings uh, of uh, the uh, Kabul regime, current Kabul regime, uh, regarding women rights and something like that. But in the core. Uh, they will try to uh, survive. That's the that's the main uh, interest that they have right now. Well, thank you, thank you very much. We have come to an end of a very interesting discussion. Uh, of course, the situation is uncertain. Uh, we don't know. In fact, uh, I was very happy to hear, at least from my Russian colleague, that uh, they will see the trends till end of the year. So that means at least we have six more months to go before we see certain changes in Kabul. Uh, but the fact is that even when they join the government, what do you visualize that all the cadres of Taliban who have no other skills except fighting or madarsa training, do they get absorbed in the military forces? How do they get economically employed? Or they will be warriors looking for the next cause. We don't know. Uh, a lot of foreign terrorists who have congregated, whether in Syria or in Afghanistan, were people who were looking for a cause. So that will remain a cause of worry. Uh, some of them, and, and the, while there may be no fissures on Taliban today, but the closer they come to power and power sharing agreement, and then the, uh, the fight uh, for the office or the loaves uh, or their willingness to surrender their economic activities, which is part of their uh, war economy, uh, will they surrender it to the Kabul authority then, which they have not done it now? So these are all open questions, and I don't think we have clear answers today. Uh, my own hunch is that uh, it may not happen that easy. There was a question on whether under COVID, Taliban would need assistance. Yes, they may need assistance, but uh, the question is who's going to provide it? And Taliban, as of now, have just been overrunning districts. They are not governing districts, and they don't want to hold on to districts for the simple reason that their military strategy has far outstripped their political strategy. They have no governance model. They are not delivering services, because once you hold a district, you will be asked to deliver services, justice, etc. We have seen some cases of instance justice being delivered. Um, so I don't know whether uh, we have come to that state. Uh, and of course, when we talk of Afghanistan, and this is my personal view, we tend to look at it in binaries, that it is either a democratic Islamic republic or it is Taliban. We all tend to forget that Taliban was only an aberration. The regime of Taliban was a five-year aberration in a 200-year-old history of Afghanistan. And that is not the default mode that we have to really accept. So all you know, it may go through a turbulent time. It may see a certain... Uh, regime. And of course, if the society has radicalized so much that that becomes normal, then so be it. Maybe you will have to live with, uh, there are other countries which are run by clerics and they have a managed democracy. Uh, maybe they will evolve a model of their own. Who knows? So with these words, sir, thank you very much. And I must say that in the report, you don't need to update too much except some of the timelines which have already sort of either come true or uh, uh, in terms of the withdrawals, etc. Uh, otherwise, the basic thrust of the report remains the same. Uh, and I also agree that there is a lot of scope for all of us to agree uh, to work together. And at least we can agree that we all want a united and stable Afghanistan, uh, whoever runs it, but runs it in, in a sensible manner. So with these words, thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists and to ORF. Uh, and uh, see you next time with the next report. Bye. Thank you.